Okay, so um, I ended last time talking about uh, what I mean by semblance. And semblance has a, uh, a definite, you know, very limited definition to most uh, geophysicists. And I basically would like to broaden it and say that uh, <clears throat> all of these linear transformations, Fourier transform, zero offset migration, NMO stacking, slant stacking, um, many others that we'll see soon. Um, all these linear transformations are semblance calculations because they evaluate the resemblance of the data to the impulse response of the inverse of the linear transformation. So this is best illustrated with uh, some examples. <clears throat> okay, the slant stack, it's going to... Um, if you have a, uh, a point in the um, um, a point in the HT domain in a CMP gather, everything else is zero. And you slant stack that. What you're going to get is a tilted line. Okay. Uh, if uh, so, it, it's going to have different uh, different tau's depending on what p you're you're uh, stacking at. And I think you can e easily imagine casting some straight lines from, from some different tau's uh, into this uh, point. And the ones that are going to hit it are going to end up along this straight line. That's in linear slowness, linear p. It's not a straight line in, in uh, linear velocity. But we're doing p tau stacking here. OK, now likewise, the inverse slant, which as we'll find out is really just the transpose the adjoint slant, okay, that starts with a, a point in p tau. And very similarly, when you, when you uh, slant stack, when you slant stack in the p tau, tau domain, okay, you slant stack across p tau, and you're going to find a line that is tau plus 2 pH. All right. So, um, uh, and that's in, in your CNP gather again in uh, T and H. So, if, like you can understand, I think, that if you have a line in the TH domain, a line in your CNP gather, and you slant stack it forward, you're going to end up with a point. Okay? So, the impulse response of the inverse slant stack is a line, and the forward slant stack evaluates the resemblance of your data to straight lines. And it's going to put those, a straight line that it finds in your input data, it's going to put at the appropriate points in the p tau domain. So a slant stack emphasizes features of the data that resemble straight lines. An NMO stack emphasizes features like hyperbole as you might expect, and as I showed you uh, in that example a uh, couple uh, lectures ago. So we'd be very interested in knowing, OK, if we have a simple layer over a half space. All right, so here's a cross section and uh, layer cake geology. Right, We're assuming that for this uh, little section on, on slant stacks here. Um, we have a velocity contrast here. Okay, which, as you know, is going since uh, the velocity below the contrast is greater than the velocity above, that velocity contrast will act as a refractor. It'll act as a reflector, and then maybe down below we put some uh, some deeper reflector, not really having to define what the velocity below that is. Okay, because we're not going to sample that. So uh, what do you get? Okay. In, uh, and, and this should be very familiar to you. In the H and T domain, right? you, uh, you do a uh, common midpoint gather above this. And of course, since it's flat, it doesn't matter where you put the common midpoint gather. Okay? It doesn't matter what M is. It just matters what H is. All right? And all the, common, all the different common midpoint gathers should be exactly the same because it's a uh, flat structure. So. Uh, between the say the sources here and the receivers here, you get a straight line. 
Okay, as you increase the half offset around that uh, that midpoint, you get a straight line. That's the direct P arrival, and it's at a slowness, a slope, which is the inverse of v zero. Okay, and then as you know, you can find a crossover when that uh, refracted wave comes out in front of the uh, the first arrival. Um, of course, it starts at a critical uh, a critical distance and then stays straight and it's going to have a uh, <clears throat> it's going to have a uh, a p a slowness call it p1 that is the inverse of v1 all right that slowness of course its uh, intercept time is delayed it's not zero the direct arrival has a zero intercept time the uh, the uh, refracted arrival has an intercept time that is uh, um, Dependent on the uh, on the depth of that velocity interface, uh, and then there's going to be a triplication, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> depending on uh, the uh, uh, the sharpness of the reflector, the sharpness of the uh, reflectivity contrast. Or the sharpness of the velocity and density contrast, and the wavelength of your waves, you may you might see a um, uh, a near vertical reflection. And uh, since we're using a you know infinite frequency waves here, and uh, uh, in this little demo, and and uh, and we have uh, an infinitely thin uh, reflecting interface. Okay. Um, we always see a, uh, a zero offset reflection, and we know how to calculate its. Uh, you know, given the the properties, we know how to calculate its um, uh, reflection coefficient. But there's the, going to be the arrival time, and as as we know, it's also going to be in a um, hyperbola that uh, is asymptotic to the p zero line. All right, and so the um, Pre-critical reflection we'll call A, and then this obviously the uh, um, refraction connects to the uh, the pre-critical reflection at the critical point, and then beyond that there's still a reflection, but it's a post-critical reflection. And for most, um, you know, as you as you also have read, I'm sure, for uh, you know most simple velocity contrasts like this one. You know, which could be the water table, it could be uh, the basement, it could be the uh, the moho, um, where uh, impedance increases with depth. Um, the uh, the post critical reflection B is going to be stronger than the uh, than the pre critical reflection. That's the way the amplitude versus offset goes. Um, now. Uh, uh, Seismologists would call this a triplication, right? Because you go out here and you come back along the pre-critical, the post-critical reflection. You come back to uh, zero uh, propagation angle, and then you go go back out to the uh, the refraction. Okay, so because there's a, a ra ranges of offset here, uh, where you see it's a triplication because you see see three arrivals. Okay, like here, there's the uh, um, there's the P. Direct P. There's the uh, usually hidden um, refraction, and then there's the post-critical reflection. You know, here there's the the, uh, the visible refraction, then the direct P, which you can usually see, and then the post-critical reflection, which you may or may not see. Okay. Um, now this uh, the reflection down below some hyperboloid. Okay. All right. Let's take so the, this is you know the arrival times in a common midpoint gather. Hopefully everything I've just talked about is uh, is review, but at least we can get it cemented in our in our in our minds. And we transform this common midpoint gather with a slant stack to a p tau image. All right, and we trace out where the energy in that p tau image uh, appears. And as you might expect, okay. This uh, straight line of the direct arrival is going to uh, come in at tau equals zero, 
and it's going to come in at p0 equal to 1 over v0. And so there will be a lot of energy right there. Okay? I should have you know, made that a, uh, a strong point. Okay? The refraction, which would be less strong uh, in amplitude in most cases than the, uh, than the uh, direct arrival, that will slant stack in just, a, just above the, uh, uh, the apex of the pre-critical reflection hyperbola. Okay? So that'll be at some uh, you know, non-zero uh, tau. And it's at uh, p1 equals v1. So that's back here. p1 is less than p0. So it's back here. It's at non-zero um, uh, non tau. So it's up, up here or down here. And there's uh, where, uh, um, where that point, uh, that all of the energy in that linear uh, refraction should go into this one point, right? Because uh, uh, the refraction line uh, resembles the uh, the impulse response of inverse um, slant stacking. Okay. Now connecting connecting the uh, uh, the uh, point that's the Direct p and the uh, and the refraction is going to be an ellipse, and for constant velocity v zero, it's going to be an ellipse exactly. And in fact, that that ellipse will uh, that connection actually is uh, you know if you go through this and erase uh, or mute out certain features and then slant stack it, you could see that uh, this uh, uh, this part of the ellipse here that connects uh, p zero and and uh, uh, and C is B. It's the post-critical reflection. And then continuing past C, that's the pre-critical reflection. And notice that the pre-critical reflection comes to 0p at its apex of the hyperbola, which is at a time which is you know, just a little bit uh, greater, a little bit below the, uh, uh, where C is. Okay? And then coming from C also is an ellipsoid which is the slant stacked hyperboloid that's the deeper reflector. Okay, so so uh, you know simple, uh, very simple situation, simple shape, shapes. Um, I think it's clear uh, uh, where the points come from. Okay, so other than points, what we've got in here is an ellipse and an ellipsoid. Where do the ellipses come from? Let's take a constant velocity medium with uh, purely, say, density contrast reflectors, or at least some kind of impedance contrast reflector that is not a velocity contrast. So we've got a uh, flat reflector at z0, z1, z2, z3, OK, constant velocity. And in our common midpoint gather, each of these reflection hyperbolas is going to be asymptotic to the same, um, to the same uh, uh, direct P line, which I haven't quite drawn correctly here. Um, but uh, I think you get the idea. So each hyperbolic reflection you describe by this uh, travel time equation, and you can see it is a hyperbola, as you know. Um, t squared v squared is equal to z sub i squared, where i is the index of the reflection we're looking at, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, um, plus x squared, where x is equal to 2h. Okay. So now let's take uh, let's parameterize uh, uh, z and x because we've got a slant stack, and so z is going to be equal to v t cosine theta, right? This is a parameterized ellipse. So so this is typical of uh, Clairbaut. Uh, you know he 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 observes an ellipse. You know he does the slant stack before he knows uh, what uh, what shape things should be. And, uh, and he says, oh, it's an ellipse. Um, and so he parameterizes an ellipse and, uh, and then substitutes it, substitutes it into the, um, the travel time equation and see if it works. Okay? And uh, it, in this case, it does. Um, so that, you know, he didn't, uh, he didn't derive the, uh, the ellipse uh, uh, in so much as he, as he matched it. Okay, 
So it's a very typical uh, uh, algebraic trick of Clairvaux. All right, so we'll parameterize an ellipse, uh, which is uh, vt cosine theta, and for z, and x is equal to vt sine theta, which is equal to uh, z tangent of theta. So there's a, uh, a hyperbola in x and t, which is an ellipse um, in, uh, um, in p tau. And so then we take our p tau transform, which is our linear move out correction. Tau is equal to t minus px. Okay, zero offset time is equal to the the full time minus uh, the p we're at times x. We substitute in for uh, uh, into this uh, linear move out correction. We substitute in the equation for the ellipse. Okay, and um, so we have tau is equal to z over v cosine theta minus uh, sine. Uh, theta over v times z tangent theta, right? Um, and so we have tau is equal to z over v cosine theta. And with uh, sine theta, this is just you know simple um, um, you know simple wave propagation now, uh, Snell's law basically. You know sine theta, the, the ang theta is the angle of propagation, is equal to PV. Okay, that's the you know theta is the link here because uh, where what is P? Well. You know, p is related to the velocity and the and the uh, sine of the the angle from vertical of the of the uh, wave propagation direction. Okay, so uh, we 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 make that substitution. We have uh, tau is equal to zero over v times um, square root of one minus p squared v squared. Or, you know, writing it out as a, as an ellipse. Okay, um, we have. Uh, uh, one axis of the ellipse being uh, uh, t over z squared plus p squared uh, is equal to uh, one over v squared. Okay, so we've got an ellipse with a, a I'm sorry, not t tau with a tau axis linearly related to z. Okay, so there's the uh, the tau axis. What's the uh, what's the uh, the p axis? The p axis is always um, is always uh, uh, goes to one over v. Okay, so here's those different ellipses for those different reflections. You know, zero, one, two, three. Um, the tau intercept of the reflection in p tau space is controlled by the depth, while the p intercept is controlled by the velocity. And then, in between, you have an ellipse. So let me show you some some data. Okay. This is often illuminating. This is a uh, um, some uh, what used to be deep and long offset reflection data. It's from a bedrock terrain in the in the Mojave Desert. Um, <clears throat> um, right. It's uh, it's on top of a uh, uh, the what's called the Ram Schist, which is a uh, subduction complex in the uh, Mojave. Kind of uh, spread out along the San Andreas Fault, and then weirdly, also along the uh, the Garlock Fault in that Mojave wedge, pointing to the west and creating the big bend of the San Andreas Fault. Um, <clears throat> probably most of Southern California is underlain by this uh, subduction complex, um, um, <clears throat> and um, uh, you know, being uh, being the the uh, the Essentially, the deep crust there, just like the Franciscan is the deep crust under most of Northern California, the Franciscan subduction complex, Melange, as they call it up there. <clears throat> so, uh, we just have a uh, shot record here, not a CMP gather. And um, uh, you can see some, uh, you can see uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, being a desert uh, environment, a bit like. Uh, um, a little bit like uh, uh, Santa Medio, you see some of the same features. Uh, look at this uh, shingling uh, as we've uh, as we've observed. You know, you have uh, faster velocity that it it, it uh, pulls back, and then faster velocity and it pulls back. Faster velocity, and I suppose it would pull back there. And so these are little. Uh, we're going across little uh, lateral velocity contrasts. Uh, and probably looking down a uh, uh, down a, a line of uh, 
a bedrock dip. Um, and so the far side uh, gets these uh, um, diffractions that are pretty easy to see. There's another one there. Okay. Um, not a lot of reflections in this part. Um, you know, the, the paper published on this line shows reflections that are coming in at, uh, you know, this, this display goes down to uh, four seconds and the, uh, um, uh, the, paper, uh, the paper published on this line uh, really starts its interpretations at six seconds in the mid crust and continues down to 12 seconds in the, in the deep crust. So I'm not showing the good part of the data. I just wanted to understand, you know, what's going on with these, uh, with these with this refraction. It's a series of refractions, as you can see, shingled like this. Um, and here's a uh, uh, a slant stack, and then here's kind of a, a semblance, a, a coherency, a Harlan coherency, as I'll explain later when I talk about Harlan's uh, signal analysis methods. Okay. So we've got a, a coherency view, which is all positive trace values. And then here's the actual slant stack, which has both positive and negative values. OK. And um, so uh, uh, what are we looking at? You can see uh, an ellipsoid, right? And that's, uh, that's probably this, this reflection here. Um, and uh, you can see that the. Uh, the green, um, uh, the green uh, refraction, first arrival, this is vibrator data, um, is following uh, this, uh, this path here. You know, there aren't very many straight lines, so that straight line is, gonna, is going to uh, stack into, uh, uh, slant stack into one point, and that straight line will stack into one point, but they're, you know, they're connected by curves. And so that's all connected uh, through here. Let's see. P increases to the uh, to the uh, 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 to the left in these views, um, and tau increases down. So uh, the uh, the deeper stuff, which you can see is is so multi-cyclic here, is uh, down here uh, at the farther offsets. And this is the shallower stuff here at uh, larger p. You know, out here we're getting to some pretty high velocities. Okay, so just an illustration there, and you know, this is a pretty complex record, and you know, without much trouble, this slant stack kind of boiled it down to uh, uh, you know this wiggly green line and one. Um, uh, and one um, and one ellipse. Okay, one reflection we can see pretty strongly. Maybe these here are other reflections. You know, and I, I didn't go all the way to uh, zero p, so I don't know. You know what those might connect to. Uh, the, these are little fragments of ellipses here. Perhaps they're not very strong. Um, uh, there's a, there's another thing you can see in there, which is the uh, this uh, linear thing here. Okay, so a line in a slant stack. What did that come from in the gather in the original TX gather? A point. So uh, uh, and uh, we have a couple of points on this, uh, and they are the terminations uh, at the edges of our record. Okay, of this strong uh, first arrival. So here, you know, this first arrival builds and builds toward the source, and then boom, it's cut off. Okay, and that causes, uh, you know, that looks like a a point. That cutoff, um, you know, looks like a Dirac delta function, and so there's there's its uh, impulse response. Um, there's another cutoff down here at. Uh, Two and a half seconds, um, so that should be in here, and uh, that that could be the origin of this. You may see a pattern of lines that are dipping like this. Um, so that's uh, that's probably where that's coming in. All right. 
So that's a you know simple slant stack, and um, uh, you know applied in the uh, in the traditional way. But it turns out that p tau analysis, as earthquake seismologists have, have recognized, has a uh, uh, a lot more uses. Okay, and um, these were uh, worked up by uh, a long, long time ago by uh, I think it was a French mathematician, uh, Radon was his was his surname, uh, and it's just a, a terrific name uh, for. Uh, uh, for someone who uh, who essentially put in the, the mathematical foundations of tomography, okay, the radon transform is is a generalized description of the slant stack, and we'll see later that the radon as and I think you'll get the sense here today, the radon transform is connected to uh, transmission tomography or you know X-ray, you know CAT scan type uh, medical tomography that sort of thing. All right, so we define a uh, an integral equation. We start with a a a scalar uh, field, call it F. It's in an x y field, or an x y uh, set of axes, and um, it has a scalar value at, at each combination of x and y. And um, we sample that that uh, field and integrate it along this straight line. Okay, so that could be a, a, a line of sight, the blue line of sight through the uh, through the brown smoke cloud today, and uh, you know what you'd expect. You integrate that uh, the effect of the smoke along the line, and uh, uh, you know you'll you'll get the uh, the total effect of of what you're trying to look through uh, the smoke cloud in that direction at. <clears throat> so. Uh, uh, we have the scalar field at uh, to sample it along this line. We just take it at x, and we integrate over every x. Okay, and then you know how do we follow the straight line? Well, we just use the equation y equals ax plus b, and so there's uh, y equals ax plus b. There, we uh, we have set. You know this this is going to get us the uh, the the radon transform. This one integral. Is necessary to get us the radon transform for at one value of a paired with one value of b. Okay, one value of the intercept b at one slope a. Uh, so, uh, if we want to get the slant stack for a range of values of a and b, well, then we got to do this. Uh, you know, let's say there's ten thousand, hundred by hundred, hundred different values of a, hundred different values of b. And so we have uh, 100 by 100, uh, 10,000 pairs of A and B. That means we've got to do this integral 10,000 times. Okay. Um, a lot of things are, are done via that, that sort of repeated integral, like the Fourier transform. Okay. So we have uh, this integral summing the effect of a 2D function along a line. And uh, you know, here it is just expressed in terms of slant stacking. For slant stacking, you know, uh, um, our our slope is called p, the slowness. Our intercept is called tau, the zero offset time. And so, what we're really doing is uh, uh, integrating the uh, uh, the field. Uh, again, uh, we start with uh, f as a function of x and uh, and and t. And here's uh, uh, x, and this is t equal to um, this is not, you know, this is solving it for the equation for for t instead of tau. So we have t equals p x plus tau. All right. So slant stacking is is really just a radon transform over the wave field with uh, p with x equal to two h and y equal to t, integrating along t equals p x plus tau. So I think you can see and easily imagine uh, how to calculate. The slant stack capital F uh, of p tau by summing in the physical domain, and uh, Jeff Thorson, who is another one of my academic uncles, student of Clairbout's, uh, asked the question. Uh, well, maybe Clairbout put the question to him: Can we do the same thing in the Fourier domain? Because uh, you know this is back in the uh, in the early '80s when uh, uh, 
it was hard to do that many integrals uh, with the memory that we had available. You know, a really big computer had had four megs of RAM, so uh, it was uh, it was tough. And if we could do it with a uh, with a Fourier transform, you know, it would take uh, thousands of times less time in the computer because we can use the fast Fourier transform. We covered all that in uh, 706. Um, so, so at the time, you know, we had the computer efficiency motivation, and um, uh, then there's all the benefits of expressing <clears throat> your linear transform in 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 terms of the Fourier domain, right? If if you know, we we didn't really realize what we had in terms of NMO stacking or or uh, or uh, uh, zero offset uh, migration. We didn't we didn't quite realize what those were until we expressed them in the Fourier domain and learned how to compute them um, using the Fourier transform. Okay, and then we learned we learned lots of things. We learned that that like the Fourier transform, those linear uh, those linear transformations had an inverse. We learned that they were linear because they're just a sort of variety of the Fourier transform. Um, uh, we learned that they're uh, uh, um, that they have certain uh, properties. They'll give certain uh, artifacts. Okay, so you know, uh, even aside from from you know the utility, you know, if you have a non-aliased, non-spatially aliased uh, wave field p x of x and t. And it's continuous enough, you know, because it's got to be a pretty well-behaved uh, piece of data to shove through the Fourier transform, especially horizontally. Um, even aside from from that and the speed up we get, what we really get is a huge theoretical advantage. We get a much deeper understanding of the of the of the uh, of the new linear transformation, the new uh, wave field transformation, once we know what its representation is in terms of the Fourier transform. Okay, so uh, so Thorson uh, uh, proceeded in this way. Um, he transformed uh, p of x and t into in in two D with two D uh, with a two D f of t into p of k of uh, and omega. And uh, there's the uh, the two D uh, transform. Here's the um, the two dimensional um, uh, Fourier exponential e to the i omega t, and then uh, multiplied by e to the minus i k x uh, k times x, right? This is k, and this is k times x. It's not k sub x, although it could be k sub x, right? <coughs> but just for simplicity, we'll just call it k. So that's uh, e to the i times omega times t minus i um, times k times x. That's uh, uh, and then that's multiplied by the uh, uh, the wave field p of x and t integrated over x integrated over t. Okay, not showing the limits as as Clairbout never does. Okay, of course the limits are are the the limits on the uh, the Fourier transform, and it's Clairbout's practice to kind of improperly leave out the scale factor, okay, on the forward direction, and then apply the scale factor twice in the inverse direction. Okay, so Thorson's following that practice. Now, recall from 706 that uh, you know p is not equal to k over omega. P has a Fourier dual with k of k and omega, and you know we can go back to uh, the uh, um, you know kind of the Jacobian of of uh, of these uh, um, Fourier duals. Um, you know, remember that p is uh, is dt over dx, and uh, so what we uh, are ending up with is uh, uh, k over omega, and uh, we'll we'll put that in. And uh, uh, notice that I'm I'm uh, uh, in this treatment. Uh, we're actually using the uh, absolute value of dt over dx. Okay, so we eliminate uh, eliminate uh, k. So we have now, p is a function of omega times p 
time, uh, and then omega, that's the slant stack, okay, is equal to the uh, Fourier transform, and here we have the Fourier exponential, e to the i omega, but look at this, now uh, we've, we factor out i omega, and we have t minus px, and there's the wave field, we still get the same, uh, still have the same uh, um, uh, uh, integration directions. So let's change the integration variable now from t to tau with tau equal to t minus px. Okay, so p of uh, omega times p and omega, right, is, uh, and remember that's, uh, that's related to k, okay, um, is uh, equal to e to the i omega tau and then on the inside, we're going to do the other integral, the integral of p uh, of at x and tau plus px, integrated over dx, and then integrated over, over d tau. Okay. So now let's let's insert the uh, the Fourier tran the excuse me the slant stacked data set, which I'll call p bar. Okay. So uh, uh, you know since we're just doing algebra, we can just insert it. Okay, and uh, so that's p bar of p and tau, all right, and um, that's, uh, uh, you know, the definition of the slant stack, according to radon, right, is the integral over x of p at x and t plus px, right, so we can just insert the slant stacked data set, and there it is, okay. So p of omega times p, or p at omega times p and omega, uh, and then we have to integrate uh, the uh, the slant stack data set uh, uh, multiplied by e to the i omega tau. Okay, uh, and that's another Fourier. Uh, uh, that's another Fourier uh, 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 Fourier exponential. Okay, so um, um, so this is a this is a Fourier transform. This is a Fourier transform from tau to omega, right? So how do we pull the slant stack data set out of here? Well, we just use the inverse Fourier transform. So there's the exponential for the inverse Fourier transform, right? It's just the negative of the of the uh, exponential for tau to omega. So this is uh, in inverting it. It's going from omega to tau. Okay, and it's just a 1D inverse Fourier transform, right? There's the, and this becomes a uh, Fourier uh, integral now. You know, 1D Fourier transform, and uh, this is p um, at uh, uh, k equals omega times p, and at 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 omega, right? Um, and we're integrating over d omega. So, so what are we, what are we doing here? All right. Um, this is uh, this is showing that um, we take our data. Okay, we it's it's p of x and t. We Fourier transform it to p of k and omega. Okay. Um, and so we have uh, a two D field. P of k and omega, and um, we uh, uh, we then do an inverse Fourier transform, uh, but only one d. Okay, so we got to extract from this two d p of k at omega. We have to extract something that is one dimensional. Okay, we're we're gonna you know this whole one d inverse Fourier transform is going to get us you know one point in the slant stack, right? At one, you know, we set p to some value, we set tau to some value, so we know what they are. You know, when we're doing this integral, we know what tau is, we know what we know what p is, okay. And so we go to do the integral, we go to do the inverse Fourier transform, and uh, what we are doing is we're extracting what's called a central slice. Okay, we have a two D Fourier transform field, so this is the omega axis here. And here's the uh, the k axis, all right, and uh, and we just and our and our data is sitting, you know, uh, like a Rorschach Rorschach uh, ink blot, uh, you know, around those axes, 
and uh, and so we say, okay, we're looking at uh, at uh, uh, p equals something and tau equals something, and we um, um, we take a, a central slice. That is at uh, you know across this k and omega field at the omega we want, okay, and um, and at the uh, uh, the the uh, the k that we that we calculate via k equals omega times p, okay. So we've set uh, you know in the middle of the integration here, in the middle of the, of the Fourier transform, right? We uh, this inverse Fourier transform. We have uh, we have some omega we're working on. We know what p is because we're getting it, getting you know just one point on this uh, slant stack field p bar. Okay, so uh, we extract that that slice, and, uh, and we have to be careful with interpolation. Uh, you know, Thorson's paper talks a bit about that, um, and uh, we end up with a mapping of k to uh, omega p. All right. So then, for each uh, each value of p, we end up inverse transforming uh, from omega to tau. Okay, so um, um, you know there's uh, we have to do the two D uh, fast Fourier transform to get to get it uh, the data section into uh, k and omega, and then um, we do uh, there's just a succession. Uh, of uh, of one D um, inverse transforms for each value of uh, of p that we want, you know, over the full range of p that we want. Okay, because you know, out of the inverse Fourier transform, we get we get all the tau's all at once. Okay, so you know, here is uh, um, slant stacking expressed as an inverse Fourier transform. Um, and of course, uh, you know, first we have to forward transform the, the data. Okay, this uh, Fourier transform method—it's um, not—it's not used much. So, so uh, uh, you know, these days, uh, slant stacking is almost always done, you know, with with the simple uh, radon integration. You know, again, interpolation is important. Um, uh, but uh, it gives us this huge uh, theoretical uh, theoretical advantage. Okay, the speed is not so critical anymore, but the insur the assurance that the slant stack is a linear process and that it is invertible is absolutely key. Okay, so what is this uh, this inverse slant stack? All right, the inverse uh, uh, and it turns out the inverse radon transform is also tomography. The reconstruction of a function given line integrals through it. Okay, so we start with the two D uh, inverse Fourier transform. Um, so uh, uh, we have here uh, uh, the uh, the k to uh, to x transform. This is e to the i times k times x. This uh, and then here wrapped around that is the inverse. Uh, um, Omega to t transform e to the, and the exponential is e to the i times omega times t. Okay, just to keep those clear, we substitute in uh, uh, k equals omega p, like we learned how to do, uh, and uh, then the the uh, uh, dk uh, is equal to omega dp. <clears throat> the Jacobian is is the absolute value of omega. Okay. So uh, uh, in the in the middle, we we have the substitution, right? Uh, and we have uh, instead of the uh, the k to uh, to x inverse, we have exponential. We have e to the i omega times p times x. Here's the uh, the central slice, right, of the Fourier transformed uh, data, um, and there's the Jacobian um, the absolute value of omega. And we're integrating now over uh, all the p's instead, and, and then we integrate over all the omegas. All right. So uh, in here, we know already this is the uh, the Fourier transform of the slant stack. Okay, um, uh, from uh, tau to omega, and um, here's uh, uh, 
a uh, uh, what's left of our exponential, you know, what is that? Well, that's some kind of delay operator, right? Um, and uh, that is uh, what's implementing our, uh, you know, tau minus px, okay? Um, and uh, we're integrating over omega. We're integrating, you know, from from uh, from tau. We're integrating over p. And uh, here's a uh, inverse uh, Fourier transform. This uh, this dependence on the Jacobian of the substitution uh, on uh, on the absolute value of omega. Um, what does that do? Well, for zero frequency, it takes it out, right? Omega, uh, the absolute value of omega when it's zero is zero. So uh, you know on the on the direct current term, on the DC term at zero frequency, there's nothing left. Nothing gets integrated. Okay, and you know the effect of this filter increases as uh, uh, as the uh, omega in uh, increases. So it's like a high pass filter. Okay, or a low cut filter. The row filter uh, uh, absolute value of omega does not depend on p. So we separate it out of the integration and interpret uh, e to the i omega px term as a shift operation. Okay, And so we can put the whole thing in the physical domain. Okay, We have an integral over uh, the slant stack field, you know, p of uh, p and tau, and tau equal to uh, t minus px, okay? integrating over p. Right? So that's a slant stack. Okay, it's just slant stacking the uh, the slant stack field, but it turns out that's the uh, that's the inverse uh, slant stack because that gets us uh, p of x and t. Now the one you know if we just did the integral here, we ha what we have is the adjoint, the uh, transpose uh, slant stack, right? Where all we did was change the sign, right? That used to be tau plus p x. Now it's tau equals t minus px, so so that makes it the adjoint uh, 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 transform, and all we have to do is convolve with this row filter, this uh, absolute value of omega filter, and that uh, uh, that so we we take our uh, um, we take our our adjoint slant stack, and we high pass filter it. And that, and that makes it a perfect inverse slant stack. Okay, so you know maybe that's easier to understand the Fourier domain, but um, um, but here uh, uh, it's uh, uh, you know it's got this uh, nice representation um, as a uh, adjoint of a simple stack. Okay, and except for some except for some filtering, except for some high pass filtering. It's, uh, it's just another slant stack. Change the sign. Okay.